Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Avn Rodionov and today I'm going to be showing you how to make one of the meanest, if not the meanest, Slayer Exciter circuits on YouTube, which also happens to be audio modulated. Without much ado, let's begin. Let's start off by analyzing the circuits I've built in the previous video. So here's the original MOSFET Slayer Exciter. While the circuit does work, it has two major limitations, the potentiometer and the Zener diode. The limitation with the potentiometer here is that it runs across the full supply voltage. This creates unnecessary power losses, such as heating of the potentiometer. And this overheating of the potentiometer can short it out, effectively connecting the gate of the MOSFET to the supply voltage, which will break down the dielectric barrier in the MOSFET and create a short circuit. The second major limitation of the potentiometer connected to the power supply directly is that the power supply voltage, I adjust and I adjust it constantly. Because the power supply voltage is adjusted, the base voltage will also get shifted up and down. And in order to combat this, the potentiometer constantly needs to be adjusted. If for some reason the potentiometer is adjusted inappropriately, this can once again create a dielectric breakdown or leave the circuit out of oscillation. And for example, if you're lucky, into an off state, or if you're unlucky, into a short circuit. The second problem, as mentioned, is the Zener diode. Now, the reason Zener diode is here is that for optimum efficiency of the circuits, you want the feedback to become a square wave because the square wave contains the most power per period. And in order to achieve a square wave, you want to clamp the voltage between the positive and negative rails. In this case, the zero diode and the negative voltage, so zero minus the forward voltage of the zener diode. Unfortunately, because the zener diode is uh, rather slow and non-linear, this clamping occurs very poorly. There will be substantial negative undershoots on this circuit and uh, drastic overshoots as well. Additionally, the clamping, while it will occur, it will occur uh, suboptimally and you'll get a squiggly-ish line that vaguely resembles a sinusoid instead of a square wave. Because of this uh, poor behavior, you'll end up with excessive heating of the MOSFET due to inefficiencies and the MOSFET not being run in a digital mode. This can once again create excessive uh, power dissipation and pop the MOSFET. In order to improve on these shortcomings, I've created the second version of the MOSFET Slayer Exciter. Now, the main differences here are that there are two supply voltages. One supply voltage is a 12 volt LiPo battery, which will be a fixed 12 volts, and it will be powering the potentiometer here, which will one, dissipate less power, and two, create a stable voltage. Additionally, the battery will have a low ESR, and as I'm using two dedicated Schottky diodes that are rated for power because I've salvaged them from an old power supply, they will do a drastically better job at clamping the voltage to a square-ish wave, which will run the MOSFET in a digital mode and decrease the cooling. Because the biasing is independent of the power supply, I can adjust the power supply voltage to any reasonable voltage and the circuit will operate stably and uh, reliably. In the previous video, I've also added a gate driver and some rudimentary PWM modulation to the circuit. So the advantage of the gate driver is that it essentially acts as a, well, as a Schmidt trigger, I guess, and uh, helps create the 
well, convert the feedback, which is sinusoidal, into a square wave by latching it pro at proper points and um, thereby improving the efficiency of the circuit. However, because in this circuit, this Q1 NPN transistor is switching off the actual gate driver instead of, say, switching on the Tesla coil and off, what can happen is at a high enough power supply voltage, you can actually end up with a self-sufficient oscillation where the feedback will be strong enough to power the circuit through one period. And this will create all sorts of weird feedback effects and uh, potentially blow the circuit. In order to mitigate this issue, I've created an improved modulation circuit, or in this case, an improved modulated circuit. The difference here is that I am not using a gate driver for simplicity and that I am actually switching on the whole circuit on and off instead of just the gate driving circuitry. The advantage of this is that the switching will be more complete and in order to prevent the circuit from blowing itself, I'll be using a C2 decoupling capacitor which will be say 0.63 microfarads. And this circuit will be connected to a modulator. Now, the modulator circuit I've borrowed from geekcircuits.com. It's a highly useful website with a lot of interesting circuits, and I highly recommend it. In this case, this is a TL494IC, which is configured as a Class D amplifier. I've modified a few values, which is this R2. I've made it 470 ohms. And I've changed the R in to a 5 kilo ohm potentiometer so I can adjust the gain. Essentially, this circuit allows me to adjust the duty cycle and modulate the duty cycle by an audio waveform, thereby killing two birds with one stone, that is, adding, adding audio modulation to the circuit and by creating an adjustable duty cycle. Now that we understand how the circuit works, let's actually build it up on a breadboard and see it in action. I've now got the PWM modulator built up on the breadboard. The main and only difference from the circuit is that um, I'm using an adjustable 5 kilo ohm potentiometer here to have an adjustable gain. And I've got a Pi filter consisting of 68 nanofarad uh, capacitors and a large-ish inductor to filter out any high-frequency ripple that will be coming in from the Tesla coil. I've got the input connected on the over here with these two jumpers and I've got the output connected to the oscilloscope. Right now it's turned on, it's uh, doing its thing, it's working at 47 kilohertz and it's got a duty cycle of about 50%. So, let me show you how the duty cycle is adjusted, first of all. I'm going to get my screwdriver. And to adjust the duty cycle, I'll have to play around with this potentiometer and watch how I change it. So let's get it back to 50%. And there we've got the basic duty cycle adjustability. Now, let's uh, turn on the audio source, which is connected over here to this 4.7 microfarad capacitor. And let's observe the modulation. So I've got the circuit turned on, and as can be seen, there's definitely some modulation happening. I can turn up the volume, and it's definitely working. I can also adjust the gain physically by altering this potentiometer here on the breadboard. So that's more gain as can be seen and this is less gain. Let's now do a quick final test of the modulator circuit by connecting the output to a small little speaker through a capacitor which is a 22 microfarad 10 volts and a 100 ohm resistor. 
So as can be seen, it's definitely loading up the output a bit. So this is without the speaker, and this is with the speaker. And uh, also, it's worth noting that this circuit doesn't have a f negative feedback loop. So the sound quality won't be phenomenal, but it's definitely going to be more stable. And we want the stability because we're going to be running it next to a noisy source. So let's turn on the source and see what happens. Let's play. Okay, there's a there's the sound. Okay. Well, that's working. It's definitely working. So now let's uh, connect this to the second part of the circuit, which is the actual Tesla coil. I've got the second part of the circuit, the Slayer Exciter driver, set up on the breadboard. As can be seen, these are the two high power Schottky diodes. This is the main switching MOSFET. In this case, I'm using an IRF830. And I've got another switching MOSFET. This is a generic early 640 that I just happened to find in my parts bin. It's not as important as the main switch as the main driving MOSFET. It's connected to the same coil I've used in the last experiment, and the gate of the MOSFET is connected to the oscilloscope. Right now it's being biased at 6 volts by this 12 volt LiPo. And I'm gonna run the power supply. Let's uh, start off easy at like 16 volts to get a baseline. So let's turn it on. And there we go. There's a there's an oscillation. Okay, something's happening. Phone is glitching. That's a good start. Neon is lighting. And the waveform doesn't look too bad. Let's pull an arc. Okay, there's a tiny little arc. Let's try and increase the voltage to, let's say, 30 volts. Oh, not bad. Well, the waveform definitely became more square-ish. And the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of about 18 to 20 volts is acceptable. There's some acceptable decent breakout. I can pull maybe a centimeter or two. Well, it's definitely working. Let's get the camera to focus. And the current draw is around two-thirds of an amp. I've now got the circuits connected up on the breadboard. One important difference I have from the schematic here is that I've removed this 0.63 microfarad capacitor. The reason I've done this is this 0.63 microfarad capacitor, while it enables a smoother oscillation and smoother transition, I personally don't like how it sounds and I personally prefer the rougher sounding circuit without it. So, without much ado, I've got the oscilloscope probe hooked up to the input of the second switching MOSFET, and well, yeah, it's not a perfect square wave. It should be good enough to modulate. Without much ado, let's connect the circuit to 50 volts and give it a test with some uh, test sounds. Also, I'm gonna use manual focus to give you guys a good view of the arc. So let's get the arc focused. Okay, that should be focused there. Let's get it exposed there. Okay, test signal is on and circuit's connected. And it disconnected. Let's try that again. Put my hand in the background. Okay, so that circuit definitely works, and the sound, I don't know how good it's heard on the phone, but it sounds amazing in real life. Let's now scale up and do the full test at, say, 100 volts. Alright, now let's do the full 100 volt test. 
Right now I'm going to be starting off at 722 volts and cranking up from there. Let's begin. First, let's turn on the power. So let me jump this wire to here. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's working. My god, that's mean. Okay. Holy cow. Even that 72 volts, this breakout is just insane. Let me get this focused. Turn off the lights. Let's get a good close-up of that crazy breakout. Okay, sound on. Let's crank up to 100. Okay, and that thing just shorted. Well, anyways, <laughs> that was the Slayer Exciter at 100 volts. It seems I ran out of luck, and uh... oh my, that's hot. And it looks like we popped that mouse. I think we can conclude the video on the note that the circuit definitely works, but unfortunately, there are some problems such as overheating and overcurrent of the MOSFET. I'll be making a follow-up to this, where I'll be doing a demonstration of just a breakout and maybe some more improvements to the circuit. I truly hope you, my viewers, enjoyed the video and thank you for watching.